Hey everyone, it's John, and today what we're going to do is cover another key concept in the network automation world. And the key concept we're going to look at this time is the concept of desired state. So what actually is desired state? So when I first began my network automation journey, in my opinion, my perspective was that it was all about speed. It was using Python loops to be able to push out configurations really, really quickly. But here's the thing, as I got more familiar with the subject, what I realized is that it's much more about control and stability. And it's these two concepts that really tie in to this idea of having a desired state. So imagine this. What I've got here is this really massive topology of two routers. And as it happens, everything in the network right now is A-OK. -okay. So let's just have a quick peek at what the configurations are right now on this device here. So let's open up this device then. And what you're going to see is that I've got some EIGRP configured on this device. So let's look at it. Okay, so I've got configured EIGRP named mode. I'm using the autonomous system number 12 and I'm basically just advertising some networks here. Similarly, I've also configured the router ID and that is pretty much everything I've got on the box. And if I do a show IP EIGRP neighbor, you can see that I've successfully established an EIGRP neighbor adjacency over this link here to CSR router 2. So what does any of this have to do with desired state? Well, let's talk about it. So here's the thing, this configuration here is working just great. But when configured manually over the CLI, it is pretty vulnerable. So let's say we had a junior engineer on the team and they happened to make some changes to this configuration and those changes actually happen to break the network. So let's make some of these changes then. We'll go into router EIGRP IPv0 and we go into our autonomous system number 12 and let's just make this a stub then. We'll do EIGRP stub connected which will bring down the adjacency and let's just add some other stuff then. We'll go into AF interface and we'll go into gigabit 2 and we'll just change the timers as well. Let's change the hello interval to maybe seven. And let's just also add in a summary address, whatever. Okay, so let's go back and check our EIGRP configuration then. So we've got these new configurations here. We've got this hello interval change. We're now advertising a summary address, which we shouldn't be advertising. And lastly, we've also got an EIGRP stub configured. Now here is a big problem when we're dealing with CLI based automation. How are we going to get rid of these unwanted configurations? So for the most part, what you're going to have to do is use the no command followed by the unwanted command. So no EIGRP stub connected, no hello interval seven, so on and so forth. Okay, so what's the problem here? Well, think about it. What is the logical inference then? In order to negate these unwanted commands, what we've got to be able to do is to identify these commands before we can actually target them with the no command. But here's an alternative. As opposed to having to do some real in-depth troubleshooting and identify the exact commands that we need to negate, like these ones here. In this case, what we could actually do is just negate at this level here, the router EIGRP IPv0, and then just use automation to push out the commands that we want, like this one here and these ones here. So if we save these commands as our desired state, and we knew that this state was a stable state. So let's reconceptualize the problem again. Imagine this happened. Imagine you get the example of the typical troubleshooting lab when everything is broke in this weird CCIE way where it's really difficult to find out the problems. What if we just had our desired state stored in a version control system and if anything went wrong, we just triggered a script which would remove all the configurations and just reapply the desired state you wouldn't have to do all of this complex troubleshooting under the clock, trying to find out if there's a timer mismatch, an NTU mismatch, somebody's changed the K values. Simply put, if you just press the reset button by pushing out desired state, you know that you're going to be able to roll back to a known good configuration. So here's the thing, we can clearly still use this concept of desired state when automating through the CLI, but to be honest, it is still a little bit clunky because we're relying on this no command. Now this might not seem like a big deal because we can just simply apply the no command at this level here, the router EIGRP IPv0, but not everything can be solved quite as easily. Let's imagine that junior engineer happened to configure a bunch of access lists. How do you remove them? So if we go here and we do a no access list, here's the thing, this is not a valid command on its own. What you need to do here 
is to specify the exact access list you want to remove. So now it becomes clunky. You have to iterate through all these possible access list names and remove them one by one by one by one before you can have a clean slate to push on your desired state. However, if we're using something like say netconf, we have the option of doing something called an operation replace. So here's the thing, if we had some access control list as our desired state and someone added on a bunch of erroneous ones, if we push this change out via netconf with the operation replace feature, the only access list that would exist on the box would be the access list we just pushed out. Everything else would be automatically negated. We wouldn't have to find them out, hunt them out, and then prepend them with the no command. Similarly with restconf, we have the option to do a put operation. And the concept is the exact same using a put request. A put request is like an operation replace for netconf. When we put out a bunch of configurations, everything else that is not in that configuration is automatically removed. Again, we don't need to troubleshoot things, identify things, and then negate them with the no command manually. Okay, so this still might be pretty confusing to conceptualize this. So let's look at an example then. So let me show you this script, which I've just quickly written here. So the first thing I'm going to do is say from Nornir, import init Nornir. This is so I can instantiate my NR object. The next thing I'm going to do is say from Nornir underscore scraply task, import netconf edit config. This is an absolutely amazing library. And this is what I'm going to use to send my edit configuration using netconf. Next, I'm going to import the print result function just to be able to print out my results. After that, I'm going to import load YAML. This is so I can load in my host variable files into memory. And then when they're in memory, what I want to do is push them through a Jinja template. So what I'm going to do is import the template file task. Okay, so let's get to the actual logic of the script then. So the first thing I'm going to do is initialize Nornir here and tell it where my configuration file is and it's called config.yaml. The next thing I'm going to do is create a custom function called loadvars. And all I'm going to do is use the load yaml task to load in the host variable files. This is where I'm going to store my desired state. And all I'm going to do is take the dot result attribute of this task and save it to a pair host dictionary key called facts. And I'll be using this dictionary key in my Jinja template. So then what we do is we call the next function config eigrp and pass in the argument task. So all I'm going to do is use the template file task and tell the template file task the name of the template I want to use, which in this case is going to be eigrp.j2. And the location of this template is that it's in the templates folder. So once I've rendered this template, what I want to do is take the dot result attribute and save it to a variable called eigrp output. And after that, what I'm going to do is use the scraply netconf edit config and then pass it in the configuration which I just rendered and that configuration is called eigr output, which is this object here. So simply put, we're going to load in our host variable files, build the template with those host variable files and then push out that configuration using that template. So what we want to do is first look at the host variable files. Let's look at our host vars. So let's go into my host files directory and if I do an ls, you can see that I've got two files for each router. And if we go into CSR1, now this is where I define my desired state. So the end goal here is that all of my EIGRP configurations are defined right here. It doesn't matter what anyone does in the box. If I push this configuration, the only EIGRP configurations that will exist on the box will be these ones here. I won't have to go hunting for EIGRP timers or stub configurations or summary addresses. If it's not defined here, when I push it, it's not going to be on the box. So let's have a quick look at the template then, which I'm going to use. If I go into my templates folder and I do an ls, you can see I've got this file called EIGRPJ2. Let's go into it. Now, if you're not used to working with Jinja2 or with netconf, this is probably going to look pretty, pretty confusing. But don't worry about that just now. All that matters here is the concept. So what all of this is, it's just the native EIGRP Yang model, which I'm going to push onto the iOS XE device. So throughout this template, what I'm doing is populating it with values from my host variable files, my desired state. So I'm doing that calling the facts dictionary key, which I created in my script and then get into the EIGRP key and then the name key. In this case, it's going to render to the value IPv0. And the same thing just repeats for the autonomous system number. I'm just calling the EIGRP autonomous system number within my host variable files, which is going to be the number 12. And the same again here, I'm going to call the router ID and then also invoke a loop to loop through all the networks which I want to advertise, specifying the network with its wildcard. But here's the big important part here. See within my router tags, 
I've put in the operation replace, which means that anything which falls between the router tags in the Yang model is going to be removed and replaced with all of this desired state. So let's execute the script and see what happens. So again, before we actually push this script, let's go and check what's on the device. And we do is show run section EIGRP. So remember these values here, the summary address, the hello interval and the stub connected have not been defined in our desired state. Therefore, when we push the script, they should just simply vanish. So we do a Python 3 run 1.py and bam, we've just pushed out that desired state if we scroll up a little bit. So in the case of router 1, the first thing Nornir did was pull out all of these host variable files. And then what we did was render this template to populate this Yang model with those values. Then we used scraply netconf to push out this configuration. And as you can see, we've got an okay response. So let's go back to the CLI and see what happened. So if we arrow up, and as you can see, the only configurations which exist on the box are those configurations which we defined in our host variable files, i.e. our desired state. So if you can imagine someone trying to cause all kinds of mischief on the network, changing all of these really obscure values trying to trick you, then in effect it wouldn't really matter because if you can push desired state, the only thing which should exist on the box is that desired state. So what we're doing here is really increasing our ability to exact granular control over the network and because of that, we've also got an increase in stability. Now here's the real cool thing. These host variable files, this desired state, what you're going to do is keep it in version control. Let me show you that. Let's go back into my host files, go into CSR1. And let's say I didn't want to advertise these networks here anymore, just delete them. And I'll just save this. Now because what I'm doing here, I'm tracking these files using git. So if I do a git status, it's going to let us know that CSR1 has been modified. Let's push this out. And if we go back to the command line, suddenly those networks no longer exist because they weren't in our desired state. But because we have it in version control, our desired state is always trackable and always reversible. So let's go back. And let's say we decide that this was a catastrophic mistake. What I could simply say is git checkout and then do CSR1. Now we'll reverse those change. Let's go back into that file again. Those networks are back, therefore they're in our desired state. So when I push the configuration, what's going to happen? It's going to appear on the box. Do Python 3 run 1.py. And we've pushed desired state one more time. Let's go back to the box. And now those networks have reappeared. So as you can see, network automation is not just about speed. It's more than just creating 500 loopbacks in 10 seconds. It's really all about stability and control. And this concept of desired state, this concept of treating our network configurations like code really goes a long way to doing that. Now, what I will say is that there actually is some caveats and catches to this type of configuration, but I'm not going to go into it in this video here. Those type of details are certainly for another video. So yeah, if you find this content useful, I'll be covering a lot more of this type of stuff in a lot more detail in my CBT Nuggets course. And I'll leave a link to that course in the description. But for now, that's the end of the video. So keep labbing, keep practicing. Thanks very much. And I'll see you soon.